Hey folks, Dr. Mike Kittertel here for Renaissance Periodization, Renaissance Diet Book 2.0 Overview, Chapter 12, Monitoring Your Progress. We recorded it a little bit earlier, and here it is. Dieting is all good in theory, and you could make a sweet diet using Chapter 10, designing your own diet chapter, but how do you know if it's working? Well, you gotta monitor, right? There's not any complex system or action that someone sets in motion with no monitoring. Everything, you, your air conditioner doesn't assume it's working properly in your house. It monitors the temperature and matches its performance to the actual result. So when we look at monitoring your progress, the first thing we have to do is examine some normative standards because people think, okay, how lean should I be or how over fat or how much fat is okay? And, and a lot of folks get really caught up, case in point. For both males and females, there doesn't seem to be a body fat number that is too low. In other words, uh, I used to do body composition testing for sports, Division I athletes, Olympians. You read out, there are some folks, a lot of folks, it doesn't matter what you read out to them when you get their body fat, they're going to be like, oh, geez, right? So if you say you're 12% fat, they're like, oh my God, 12%, oh, and they grab something that has fat on it immediately and shy away. If you say you're 5% fat, they're like, oh, 5%, is that good or bad? Right? If you say you're 1% fat, which is almost never going to happen, you know, I think there's some people that still find that to be like, oh, geez, that's 1% that's one too fat. Right? I want to be 0% fat. So because there's that trend to want to be completely lean, which is physiologically impossible and you'd be dead, we got to sort of um, set up some boundaries for what's decent, right? And there's a range. So for males, 5% is competition lean in that area, circa 5%, maybe 2% up, maybe 2% down. It's nowhere you can be for a long time. 10% and up is the only real sustainable fat percentage for most people. But you can dip as low as 5%, a little lower, for some number of weeks and months and be just fine. On the top end, for performance and health, the average number is 20%. If you get much fatter than 20%, it's not really clear that's great for your performance and it's probably not amazing for your health. So give those numbers some thought. Now, if you're 22% and you're making crazy muscle gains, you're a shot putter, you're a power lifter, don't you worry about a thing. But if you're at, you know, 22%, you go to the doctor and he's like, nah, I can't tell you you're healthy. And also you want to be a bodybuilder, so you want to see your muscles and you don't really see a whole lot. It's probably time to lean up a little bit. It's certainly, we, you know, if you're 27, 28, 29% as a male and you're like, bah, whatever, I'm getting huge. Yeah, it's probably not the best idea from performance performance, muscle, or health. Let's get to females. Females get as lean as 10% for contest, sometimes a little lower than that, but they have more sort of essential reproductive fat than males. Females at 10% in the requisite areas judged by bodybuilding are just as lean, striated glutes, crazy crisscross abs, the whole deal. Females generally start to lose the ability to have their periods below 15% fat on average. So it's not a good idea to hang out below 15% fat because it's actually really bad for your health long term, especially for bone health. So 15% plus is a healthy normal range for females. Up to about 25% is highly athletic range, depending on how it's distributed and in your genetics. So if you're a female between 15% and 22%, you're lean, real lean. And if you're a performance athlete, you're doing phenomenal. Now, if you're a performance athlete or just a regular person trying to stay in shape, and you're female, uh, unless you're over 30% fat, there's really no cause for health concern and probably just a trade off of how you want to look, how you want to feel, how much fat loss dieting you want to do. So females will get a body fat readout that says 28%. And they're like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. It's not. For females, up to 30% is just fine. It's not really predictive of any kind of uh, disease or any kind of really crazy performance loss or anything like that. Up to 30% is cool. You can be significantly fatter than 30% and be A-OK. -okay. It's just probably not, not a good idea to purposefully exit that range. So if you're female and you're gaining muscle and you're at 25% and your coach is like, let's get you to 35%, there'll be a ton of muscle along that journey, eh, maybe stop at 30 right? But if you're at 32%, you're performing super well, you love how you look, 
and your doctor says your health is super good, don't you worry about a thing, nothing's going on. So now that we kind of know the sort of ranges there, way more about that in the book, by the way, let's talk about how we actually get those values for ourselves. How do you test your body fat? How do you test your muscularity, right? In the book, we have a list of 12 methods of body composition analysis, and they're scaled and ranked by a sort of a, a trade-off of cost and intricacy, right? So some of them are very intricate and very expensive, time-wise, money-wise, equipment-wise, access, right? You probably don't just walk into a hospital and get an MRI for your body fat whenever you want, unless you that, that's perk, perk of the job or something, that'd be amazing, right? Uh, and But those methods tend to be way more accurate and precise. On the other hand, there's methods that are super rough, super quick and easy, but they're not super precise. We're going to try to go through a couple of these today, just talk about them super briefly, and then talk about the ones that really work the best on average for most people in the real world. So I'm just going to list these out. Body weight is a measure. It's a proxy for body fat percentage and muscularity, especially for body fat percentage. For people in the fitness community, it works very, very poorly, right? Because you can be 200 pounds in solid muscle. You could be 120 in, in pure fat. Totally possible. Uh, body mass index, right? Your fat to height relationship is probably a bit better than body weight in predicting how fat you are. It works really well for large populations, insurance pools, things like that, medical field. For folks in the fitness community, very, very poor estimate, very poor measure. Body circumference, right? Your waist to hip ratio, measuring your arms and legs, starts to get a little bit more to actually start to measure stuff about how your body looks. And how your body looks can inform as to what percent is muscle and fat, very roughly, super, super rough targets there, but can be used as pretty good guideposts. Like if you start at a 40 inch waist, if you lose fat, you're gonna be losing inches off your waist every month. It's gonna happen. If you're not losing inches off your waist, your diet's probably not working, right? Uh, BIA, bioelectrical impedance analysis, shoots a harmless current through your uh, one part of your body and detects it through the other. And as the current passes through your body, the more fat it meets, the more resistant it, resistance it meets, the amount of current detected is uh, sort of indicative of how much fat versus how much not fat you have, lean tissue, including muscle. The BIA is usually a really not so great device. Its error rate is really high. So you get a number and uh, that number probably doesn't correspond to exactly anything going on, but if you're using one every week, that number changing can indicate which way you're going. So if it's going down, you're probably getting leaner. If it's going up, you're probably not getting leaner, right? But just that number probably doesn't mean much. If it says 15%, geez, you could be anywhere from 8% to 22% or something like that, and you would be none the wiser. But uh, you know, if it's 15% and then a month later it's 13%, and then a month later it's you know uh, 9% or something, eh, yeah, you're probably getting leaner. Leaner, right? Rep strength, repetition strength. What's your set of 10 on the bench press? What's your set of 10 on the squat, the pull up, so on and so forth. If those are going up, you're probably gaining muscle over the long term, especially if you're used to those movements and the technique's not a huge factor. If they're going down, especially if you're on a fat loss diet and they're going down fast, you might be losing muscle. It might not be a great thing. Great thing to keep. Mirror details, like if you look in the mirror and you notice how many abs you have, if you're running out of abs, you're probably getting fatter. If you're getting more cut, you're probably getting leaner. A lot of bodybuilders use this, especially closer to a show, when body composition devices that are measurement-based, more scientific devices, start to not predict well because they're not designed for such low body fats. And in the end, if you're a bodybuilder or you compete in physique sport, how you look in the mirror is actually the only thing that matters because I don't care, you know, if Mr. Olympia has 12% body fat, but that fat's hidden somewhere that no one sees, who cares? If you're stripped up, that's the only thing you need. Clothing fit is another one. Like if your clothes are fitting, uh, getting looser and you think you're getting leaner, okay, you're probably getting leaner, right? If your clothes are getting tighter, maybe you're getting a lot of muscle, maybe not, right? Maybe you're getting a lot of fat. Skin folds. Skin folds take a trained operator who's done thousands of skin folds themselves in order to be good, and it takes the same person every time. If you have access to that, skin folds are pretty decent. If you don't, if you do them yourself, um, there's ways to do them yourself that are decent, which we'll get to in a bit, but uh, if just a random, like a buddy of yours at the gym does it, oh my God, if it's a different person every time, it's a total waste of your time. The bod pod, uh, it's actually measuring how much air you displace. It measures your volume. It knows how much you weigh. That way it estimates your density, tells you how much is fat, how much is muscle. Very decent, has good uses. 
Underwater Weighing, the water version of a bod pod, incredibly rare nowadays, but for a long time considered the gold standard of body composition assessment. Really sweet, but you gotta go into like a, a little mini pool in the bottom of a laboratory in a building, in a kinesiology building at a university. It looks like where they filmed like a Saw movie, kind of creepy, you're probably not gonna get the opportunity to do that as they're shutting down most of these places for other types of body comp. DEXA, uh, dual x-ray uh, emission technology, um, absorptiometry to be correct, X-ray, so, so the DEXA shoots X-rays at you, and uh, they're almost completely harmless. So you get way more X-ray exposure in a uh, you know, flight across the United States in an airplane, so it's not unsafe. It's super, super accurate and precise, but it does have some caveats we'll get to in a bit. There's something called visual densiometry that you'll see more and more. You're going to stand in front of a camera, you're going to rotate, all right, and you're going to tell its body weight, you're going to type in your body weight, and based on how you look, the camera is, you know, standing on a point exactly some distance away from the camera, and there's reference markers, it's going to tell you exactly how much volume you take up, and because it knows your weight, it can calculate your density and actually do a pretty good job of estimating your body fat without shooting x-rays at you, which is cool. I, I kind of like the x-ray thing. It makes me feel like Superman. So lastly, the most accurate, the most precise, not even any comparison, body fat and muscle measurement device is magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. The thing is it takes like $1,000 to run the machine one time, right? You're not gonna get, you'd imagine being like, oh, I think I have a concussion. And the doctor's like, all right, we'll get you in the MRI. You're like, could you guys just do my whole body? Slip the doctor a 20, it doesn't really work like that, right? But for super advanced scientific studies, they can MRI and tell you how many grams of muscle you gained in your bicep. That's pretty impressive. It's nothing you're gonna run into in real life. So speaking of real life, how do we do real life recommendations for what things to use. Because I told you there's 12 of these things, right? Well, we're not gonna use all 12, that's insane. What do we do to actually do a good job in tracking our own progress and maybe the progress of our clients if we're helping other folks out with their fitness? Body weight, gotta take it. Body weight tells you if you're hypocaloric, isocaloric, or hypercaloric, and over several weeks, it's very accurate, um, it's very precise, and it can do a really good job. Take your body weight two to three times a week, very good idea. Rep strength. You have a weekly knowledge of your rep strength because every week you train with weights, hopefully, and uh, then you know how strong you are and you know if you're losing muscle or gaining it or at least maintaining your muscle. Uh, mirror and clothing, you can probably check monthly. Like if your clothing is starting to fit looser one day and the next day it fits tighter, you just had some salt, sort of this and that, and you're just bloated. But uh, on a monthly basis, and you get, every month your clothes are getting looser and your body weight's going down, you're probably doing a good job with your fat loss program. Maybe yearly or twice a year, you can do visual densiometry, a bod pod or a DEXA, right? Why are we saying to not do a DEXA if it's super precise, super often? Okay, it's not the x-rays we're worried about. Most DEXA devices, you can get a DEXA once a week, every week, and only bump up to the bottom end of the minimum radiation exposure recommended for human beings in the United States. That's not it. The reason that you don't want a DEXA too frequently is because the DEXA actually does have an error measurement. Uh, it's one or two percent, right? Um, and the one or two percent, like if you get an error of one or two percent, but you do a DEXA every two weeks, even every month, if you lose, if you gain two percent muscle per month, you're a rock star. That's incredibly rare. If you lose two percent fat per month, you're doing real well for yourself. But you could go a whole month, get a DEXA, and just because of the error, it could look like you lost no muscle at all, even though you did. It could look like you gained a bunch of fat, even though you didn't. So what we recommend, and the DEXA costs money, it's like 150 bucks a pop. Get a DEXA every six months or every year, get it in the same phase. If you're at the end of a fat loss phase, get a DEXA then. The next time you get a DEXA and compare it to that one, do it at the end of the next fat loss phase. That way the body water is roughly the same, the density is uh, really similar, and you can get a real good measurement. Don't over measure and get super crazy. Week to week, oh my God, my numbers are off, right? Not the best idea in the world. A, a slightly more, for the folks that are a bit more advanced and want a bit more numerical stuff, take your body weight every week, and take your skin fold, abdominal skin fold, and if you don't know what that means, you're not advanced enough for this tip, so don't worry about it. Um, you take your abdominal skin fold once a week in millimeters and you write it down. You're gonna develop a correlation after you get your DEXAs two times a year of what your body fat is, skin fold abdominal, 
with your weight, you're going to be able to get a body fat percentage and measure muscle mass and fat mass with that method. That's a method uh, that very, very much advised by a good friend of mine, Broderick Chavez, uh, at Team Evil GSP on Instagram. If you guys follow him, he uh, really knows what he's doing. If you use that method, uh, it can be really, really good. The thing is you can't be neurotic about it because it's going to fluctuate. It's just a good data collection tool. Remember folks, the purpose of monitoring your progress is to stay informed and stay on the right track and not to drive yourself nuts.